Welcome and thanks for joining us. We are coming to you live from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where for the next hour, you will hear about humanity's first mission to touch the sun. You're going to hear from present presenters that it will tell you the how, the why, and much, much more. All systems are go for a scheduled launch of the wee hours of Saturday morning, August the 11th. And we are going to bring to you some incredible things leading up to that launch. Joining me today, back on stage after the eclipse of last year, Karen Fox. Karen Fox, it's sun time again. It is sun time. We are going to the sun. We will be taking your questions. Uh, social media can take questions if you're using the hashtag AskNASA. And we are going to be talking about this incredible trip. We're going to the sun. It's going to get within under 4 million miles at the closest approach to the sun. Right. And, you know, Karen Fox and Dwayne Brown joined together again. But let's bring up some of these cool mission team members. And we're going to learn about humanity's first mission to touch the sun. Right. All right. So we're going to be getting to within a distance to the sun that is under 4%. So if, if Dwayne stands over there and he's the sun for a moment, and I'm over here, and I'm Earth, 4 million miles does not sound so close, right? But actually, it is within under 5% of the distance to Parker Solar Probe will be coming really up close and personal to the sun. We're going to be going That's right through close. the corona that is the solar atmosphere you can see during an eclipse. And it's going to be facing brutal heat, brutal radiation conditions, giving us our first ever view of the star that we live with. Let's get started and hear about the Parker Solar Probe mission. So first up, the head of NASA's Science Directorate and has an incredible portfolio of over 100 missions. You guys have seen him a lot on television, and he's pretty much a rock star across the world. Please welcome to the stage. He's so cool, he goes by one letter, Dr. Thomas Zubukin, but we call him Dr. Z. Welcome, Dr. Z, to the stage. <laughs> Dr. Z, 100 missions, but when you talk about this one, you have a big smile, but you made history about that mission. Could you tell the audience about that history-making decision? Uh, history has everything to do with the name on that mission. I'm just so glad you're here, Gene. Uh, just, that uh, means a lot to me personally, but it means a lot to the entire community. <laughs> this is the first time there's ever a launch of a mission and the name on the mission is represented right in the room. We've never done this, we've done it here. And uh, why did we come up with that idea? Frankly, there's no other name that belongs on this mission. It's absolutely clear that it's Gene Parker's name. And the simple reason for that is a paper that he wrote in 1958, a paper that I taught in school many times to hundreds, if not thousands of people. But it's a paper that made history because if you want, it filled the space. The paper was a prediction about the solar atmosphere that expanded and filled supersonically space everywhere, the solar wind. And that solar wind between the planets, of course, was described by a simple set of equations that you saw on TV just recently. Those equations tell us a big story. They tell about, of course, the particles that are there, the field that is being pulled out of the sun together with that plasma, but also talk to us about the threats that come from this plasma, from these particles that we think about as space weather. As a technological society, what comes towards the Earth matters. And that's uh, what uh, Parker means to us. I want to tell you also that in addition to this particular paper uh, that uh, Gene Parker wrote in 1958, of course, he basically was a pioneer in plasma astrophysics. He talked about the fact that magnetic fields are important when you look at the universe. And so I did a tally with my team and basically said, how many missions do we have in our mission portfolio that directly are involved in looking at things and measuring scientific phenomena that are predicted by uh, Gene's papers, and the answer is 35. 35 missions are covering uh, this both here in our environment, heliophysics missions, but also in astrophysics and uh, missions in planetary sciences that do the very things that Gene Parker talked to us first. 
Thank you so much. Let's have another round of applause for Dr. Z. Thank you. Next up, we have a woman with a fantastic last name. This is Nikki Fox. Uh, no relation to me, Karen Fox. Uh, Nikki Fox is the project scientist for Parker Solar Probe at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Take it away. Tell us what this mission is going to do. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, as Thomas said, this is a mission that has been in the making for 60 years. Uh, we've had to wait so long for our technology to catch up with our dreams. And why are we doing such a daring mission? We know a lot about the sun. We, it's, it's just over there. We see it every day. But the sun is full of mysteries. One of those mysteries is that the corona, that lovely atmosphere that we all saw during the so total solar eclipse last year, that is about 300 times hotter than the surface of the sun and that just doesn't make sense and so we need to go up there and and figure out why that's happening the other thing of course is we need to really understand why as Jean predicted why this atmosphere is continually expanding and continually accelerating away from the star the only way we can do that is to finally go up and touch the sun. We've looked at it, we've studied it from missions that are close in even as close as the planet Mercury but we have to go there and so how are we going to do it? So we'll launch uh, from, from Kennedy on Saturday morning on our beautiful Delta IV Heavy. And the first thing we will do when we get on orbit is encounter the planet Venus. We use Venus to give us a gravity assist, if I could have that uh, Venus thing. Uh, we, um, we do a little gravity assist. It's a bit like a handbrake turn. We're not like those other missions. We don't take energy from the planet. We give it generously. And we actually slow down just a little bit. And that allows us to uh, shrink our orbit and go closer to the sun than anything has been before. Even in our very first flyby, we will be well inside the solar corona um, and taking data in that key region. Uh, if you look at my dress, Parker Solar Probe is about at the right scale. Um, <laughs> so we will go hotter. Uh, than anything has been before. We're in that 3 million degree plasma region in the corona. We're moving faster. We're moving at about 430,000 miles an hour, or about 118 miles a second. And we're going closer, as Karen already said, to 3.83 million miles above the sun's surface. So we'll use seven Venus gravity assists. We'll gradually walk closer. We'll take sort of seven giant steps closer to the sun until we're in that final region. Of course, we wouldn't go there empty-handed. We carry with us an amazing payload of instruments. And those instruments are designed um, to make those critical measurements that we have waited so long for. We have uh, particle instruments that will measure the continually flowing atmosphere that Gene predicted in his 1958 paper. We'll also have particle detectors that are looking at those high energy particles associated with shocks and flares and coronal mass ejections and transients that we see in the solar wind. We know the magnetic field is the real key. We know that this is why we're making this daring mission. We're going to go into the transition from where the magnetic field is dominant to where that coronal material dominates the magnetic field. We need to measure the, mag the magnetic fields, obviously. Where you see changing magnetic fields, you see changing electric fields. We got one of those two. We'll also be listening for plasma waves that we know flow around when particles move. And last but not least, we have a white light imager that is taking images of the, the atmosphere right in front of the sun. It's not taking pictures of the sun. We actually are blocking out the sun's light and it's taking images of what the spacecraft is about to plow through. So really taking the first close-up images of the sun's corona. And so we are ready. Uh, we, are, we have the perfect payload. We know the questions that we want to answer. And so we will go with Parker Solar Probe. We'll unlock the mysteries of the sun and the sun's corona and we will touch the sun. Thank you. Nice round of applause for Nikki Fox. These folks really dress for the occasion, and you, you'll see why you saw Nikki's dress. And check this, uh, this gentleman coming up. So if you're just joining us, we're coming here live from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. My name is Dwayne Brown with the Office of Communications with my colleague Karen Fox. So you heard Nikki tell you why we're going. Now you're going to hear the how. Please welcome to the stage someone who is very, very familiar with the spacecraft, the project manager from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Give it up for Andy Dreisman. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you. Now, now, now Andy, before I leave, you got a, a tie. This tie is <laughs> slanted, right? Okay. <laughs> well, this is, um, my wife got this for me for Father's Day, and this is, I think, her attempt at making me fashionable. You could decide for what yourselves whether she succeeded or not. 
uh, mark, you know, in the back, 2018. So we're here, 2018. So thank you, Dwayne. Thank you all. So I'm going to spend a couple minutes telling you about um, all the technology that went into developing this spacecraft. Um, so four million miles, the sun is hot. Outside, you go outside of Florida today, the sun is hot. Four million miles, the sun is very hot. So we need to bring an umbrella with us. So just like you might wish you had an umbrella out there in the hot, sunny day, flick open your umbrella. We bring an umbrella only. The umbrella is a heat shield. It's a carbon-carbon heat shield. Uh, it took about 18 months to fabricate this heat shield and over a decade to develop. The carbon, it's only four and a half inches thick. It's got carbon face sheets on either side, and it only weighs 160 pounds. If you had tried doing this mission in the 50s or 60s or 70s, you'd be building mil big metal heat shields. So carbon is the magic material. One of the other enabling technologies is the um, solar rays and the solar ray cooling system. Like any other satellite, we need to um, generate electricity to run the, the systems on board. Uh, we have solar rays. They come out and they peek their, their little edges out behind the heat shield uh, very gingerly. And they have to deal with the full solar environment. A normal solar array would burn up quickly. Um, so we have a solar array that actually has active cooling in it. There are two pumps in the spacecraft that pump water through the cooling system, I mean through the solar array, and they pump it out through radiators. So much like your car stays cool on a hot day like today, that's the way that we keep the solar arrays cool. The final technology, and this is what we would call a distributed system, is the fault management or autonomy. Because of the orbit around the sun, there are long periods of time where we can't talk to the spacecraft, and the spacecraft can't talk to us. We're blocked out by the sun's radio noise. So this spacecraft has to be fully autonomous. Plus, we've got, at times, 16 minutes of round-trip light delay. So even when we can't talk to the spacecraft, we, it takes a while to do it. And so the system is designed to protect itself. On board the spacecraft, we have sensors called solar limb sensors. These were a new development item. And if the solar array were to lose attitude, where that umbrella started rotating away from the sun and parts of the solar spacecraft started um, uh, coming out from behind the umbra, the solar limb sensors would pick that up. And they are the first thing to pick it up. They're robust to the solar environment. And what they do is they protect all the sensitive parts of the spacecraft um, from coming out into the full sun. The last thing, and probably the most important thing that I'd like to talk about that was enabling was the team. The team that developed this has been working for, specifically on this for more than a decade, but from the science community and in some of the engineering community, it's really been 60 years. You could trace back papers and read engineering reports from the 60s and 70s about this mission, about different concepts and different ways of being able to get to this environment. Um, the team that developed this is team of thousands from around the world. I did a little math about three weeks ago, and I took the um, budget and just divided by the number of hours, and it was three million hours, I'm sorry, almost four million hours of labor, four million staff labor hours from the start of phase C to where we are today. And that team is really what enabled Parker Solar Probe to be what it is today. So thank you, Dwayne. Another round of applause for Andy Dreisman, project manager. Okay, so Andy, come on back and the other team. Now we get, uh, we're going to transition into the Q&A with this incredible team, and then we're going to go to our second part of the show. Wh what we're going to do is we're going to start here uh, in the audience, then we're going to go to social media, and then we're going to go to the phone bridge. So, and please wait for the mic, give your name and affiliation, and if you can address it to a specific person, that would be great. We're going to take a few minutes for Q&A, and the gentleman with the hat here. Name and affiliation, please. I am Jim Siegel, yeah. and uh, I'm with Spaceflight Insider. Uh, I have a question about the spacecraft itself. I believe it's going to make 24 or so uh, circuits through the corona. What happens to the spacecraft after that? So that's, that's where it makes 24 um, orbits around the sun, seven of them inter interact Venus. And on Orbit 24, what I'm hoping is we're going to continue to go. I mean, as long as we have propellant on board, we're going to continue to take science data. Um, eventually, the spacecraft will run out of propellant. At that point, at some point in the future, the, it'll be able to it'll lose attitude control, and those sensitive bits of the spacecraft, which we work so hard to protect, 
will eventually transition to the sun. So the way I like to think about it is that in hopefully a long, long period of time, 10, 20 years, there's going to be a carbon disk floating around the sun in, the, in its orbit, and that carbon disk will be around uh, till the end of the solar system. Um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press. Um, you couldn't have asked for a better opening act last year with the eclipse, as was mentioned. <laughs> um, do you really think that um, sparked a lot of more interest in this mission and brought a lot more attention to what you're about to uh, accomplish? Uh, yes, I do. I mean, I, I think that it made everybody look to the sky. It made everybody um, realize that the sun is not just a single point of light, but it has profound effects on us here at Earth. Thomas talked about some of the catastrophic events with the, the, the space weather that we see, and it really did bring up an awareness. I mean, it's a beautiful sight. My goodness, we saw the corona. Um, you know, I got very excited, but we saw the corona, and, and you don't see that every day. Well, Parker Solar Probe's going to be in there. And I think just realizing that we were sending a piece of technology that is going to go into that region that was visible during that amazing eclipse. To me, it's still mind-blowing, and I've worked on the mission for eight years, and even, even I still go, really? We're doing that? Um, so, you know, I, I think it did an awful lot to really bring up the awareness, but also for the, the entire heliophysics and the, f the amazing fleet that NASA has, and with that, I'll throw it to Thomas. Well, I just, to me, my experience during the eclipse was just that. So first of all, I was, you know, I actually didn't realize how emotional I'm gonna get. <laughs> uh, when I, you know, I've been studying the solar corona for 20 years and I saw it for the first time with my eyes, right? Kind of, it's like, that's an amazing moment. But I remember, I just like within, actually there's video footage that says that within seconds of that, it's like, this is where Parker's going to go, right? You immediately see, it's like, you, you see it there. It's, it's totally in the dark there. That's how close it, it's, it's going to be. And so for me, that, I think, made a huge difference. I do believe, actually, the name made a huge difference, too, for many people, kind of stories, personal stories attached to this, this story of perseverance, of innovation, a story of, of being right, ultimately, uh, in, the, in the face of adversity. I think those stories, they matter, and they're stories that, that are out there in the, in the community and we all resonate with. And I think the final part is, is just really, uh, once you come up with uh, the recognition that it really is the equivalent of touching the sun, kind of flying through its atmosphere, kind of that's the spark, right? Kind of it's like it, it pulls you in that, that emotional state that, that you can't forget the mission about. So what we're recognizing at NASA is this is one of the missions that has a tremendous following, uh, a tremendous uh, excitement and kind of over and above uh, many of the other missions that we have just because of this trifecta, I would argue, of, of, of values. And Marsha, stay tuned because uh, with, in discussions they're doing something pretty special on the anniversary, which is in a few weeks for the solar eclipse on August 21. So you guys stay tuned for that. What we're going to do is take one more question, then we're going to go to social media, and then we're going to go to the phone bridge. Name and affiliation, please. Ranvira Arisene with the Astronomy Outreach of Kosovo and the Talking Space. So since these sensors will be kind of outside the edge of the main heat shield, what's stopping them from melting and what are they made of exactly? Uh, so most of the instruments, um, as Andy noted, are on the main body of the spacecraft and they are at a very balmy 30 degrees centigrade, 85 degrees Fahrenheit, compared to the uh, 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit that our heat shield is seeing. Uh, we do have the four fields whips that stick out. They are made of niobium, uh, so they are very thin tubes. Uh, they, they get hot, but they're not so difficult. The solar probe cup is the bravest little instrument on the spacecraft. Uh, it bravely peeps around the heat shield, and it is a fairly big instrument. And so there was an enormous amount of testing that went into that. It is made from some pretty exotic materials. It, is, it has molytesium, it has molybdenum, it has niobium, um, and uh, it, it also is, has a lot of tungsten. And so um, it's, it had to go through a very, very, very rigorous test program. In fact, they even designed their own test facility at uh, the Smithsonian Astrophysics um, Observatory at Harvard where they could really create the atmosphere that it was going to have to see every day to make sure that it wouldn't do anything bad. Great. Let's take some questions from the social media folks in the room. Do we have a question here? Yes, sir. Uh, please wait for the microphone. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chuck Fields, Online Coffee Break. Um, I had a question. I understand the carbon-carbon is, is going to protect the spacecraft, but 
what's the duration of the spacecraft when it goes through the corona? I understand it might vary in each orbit, but how long will it actually be in the temperature of the corona? So the, um, the, the spacecraft's in uh, elliptical orbit. Think of it, um, its furthest distance from the sun is around Venus, and then every time it flies down through, flies by Venus, the perihelion or closest approach gets lower and lower. Uh, from our perspective, the, the science taking is from a quarter AU on the inbound to a quarter a AU on the outbound, so a quarter astronomical unit. I believe that the spacecraft is always in the atmosphere of the sun, as is the I, Earth. I would argue that, yes, strongly. <laughs> always. We thank live you. in the atmosphere we of the sun. We do live in the atmosphere yes. of the sun. Thank you very much. So it's really, it's about 12 days is the way we think about it. Okay, we're going to go to the phone next, um, and then we'll come back for social media. I know we have a lot of questions. We may not get to them, but um, we, uh, we have some other opportunities to answer your questions. So we're going to go to the phone bridge, and I believe we have Denise Child from NBC News. Denise? Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, with um, the Parker Solar Probe sort of set to become the fastest ever human-made object, I'm wondering if you can comment on that milestone and also talk a little bit about the challenges of designing something that will be traveling that fast in space. It will be the fastest human-made object at 430,000 miles per hour. Uh, that's on its last orbit. Um, well, it's third to last orbit at the closest approach and at perihelion. Um, Designing something to go fast in space is pretty much the same as you would design it to go slow in space. Space has no, nothing to really um, impede its progress, the spacecraft's progress. So from a speed perspective, there isn't much of a, a concern. The spacecraft doesn't know it's going fast. What is maybe more interesting and a little esoteric is that Around the sun, there's a hypervelocity dust environment. So that's really what this, you know, the speed gets you. So it, the spacecraft intercepts dust particles, and the spacecraft has shielding on board. Um, it's built into the blankets. It's built around the cooling system. And this Kevlar shielding protects the spacecraft from this, what we call, hypervelocity dust environment. So that's probably the biggest um, impact, no pun intended, <laughs> of going fast. We have one more question now from the people who have been using hashtag AskNASA to ask a question. So let's go to that question, and then we will be taking questions at the end again. Back in March, members of the public were invited to send their name to the sun aboard the Parker Solar Probe spacecraft. Twitter user David, who goes by at no stuff uh, on Twitter, asks, what will happen to all of our names uh, aboard the craft? So uh, your names will continue to orbit uh, with the spacecraft. Um, and, and even after the, the, we have no fuel, um, as Andy said, he thinks about the carbon disk um, circulating, you know, going around the sun. I think if the, the spacecraft will break up into large pieces and then smaller and smaller until it becomes part of the dust cloud. So your name is going to orbit the sun forever. Fantastic. Okay, Thank so you. let's take another one more question and then one more. Then we're going to wrap up and bring you the second part of the show here. Um, right here with the mic. Where's, where's the mic? Oh, you have the mic. <laughs> Hi, Kent Kramer, Rocket STEM and uh, Space Up Close. Thanks for, for, for doing this. You talked about it um, took 60 years for the technology to, to catch up. And you mentioned specifically the heat shield. What, what else on the, on the spacecraft, maybe the, uh, the science instruments, took 60 years of development? I mean, certainly finding the, the right materials, um, it isn't just a case of surviving those incredible heat uh, when we're close to the sun. We out, as we've all mentioned, we come out around Venus and it's cold there, which means that these materials have to withstand heating and then cooling, very, very, very extreme changes in temperature, uh, 24 and then apparently another 10 years beyond that, according to Andy. Um, so, you know, they, they, have to be, <laughs> they have to be incredibly um, durable. So uh, certainly the, uh, the materials. And then I often uh, liken, you know, 60 years ago, if you wanted to make a phone call, you had a rotary dial phone that was on your kitchen wall. Now we all use smartphones, and we use them, I bet you, for everything other than making a phone call. If I have to make a phone call, I've broken down any other way of communicating with somebody, and now I've actually got to call them. Because of the way we, our technology has changed, the way we live has changed. And if you think about the technology you hold in your hand in your iPhone, and you compare that to what that would have have taken in 1958, you're talking city blocks worth of buildings of, of that type of thing to be able to do the autonomy that Andy was talking about. So there are, you know, light weighting, miniaturization, materials, everything that goes into making the spacecraft small, compact, and light enough so that our wonderful launch folks can give us the kick we need to go into orbit. 
you mind if I add one uh, point about the instruments? Uh, I really believe that, uh, I think, uh, just in the same realm as uh, Nikki talks about the spacecraft, the instruments have also benefited from multiple generations of instruments that have flown on spacecraft that are, say, a spacecraft like stereo, a spacecraft like wind or the advanced composition explorer or others, in which some of these uh, instruments were for the first time really perfected and, and, and then integrated and made smaller. The instruments are every way, in every way as advanced as the mission that the spacecraft is around it, I would argue. Kind of a really, really top-notch instruments that with the mass that is available, which of course is, is uh, limited because we want to all use every single pound for fuel, right? Because we want to go in there with that, with, within those limitations, those are instruments that were not possible to build even, even uh, 40, 30 years ago. We had to do the others ones first. Okay, that's going to do it. Please give a nice round of applause again to Dr. Z, Nikki Fox, and Andy Dreisman. Thank you all. All right, we are going to get started next talking about the launch itself. That's right. And if you're just joining us, again, we're coming to you live from NASA's Kennedy Space Center, where we're just a few days away from an early morning launch of humanity's first mission to touch the sun. My name is Dwayne Brown with the Office of Communications, my colleague Karen Fox. So we've heard about the science and everything now. The folks that are going to make some noise and fire and all this good stuff. Um, the person who I've had the honor of working with many years, the launch director for this incredible mission, his name is you know, synonymous with great launch missions. Please welcome to the stage the launch director for the Parker Solar Probe Mission, Omar Baez. Thank you. Thank you for all attending. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm super excited. This first time that NASA is launching a Delta IV Heavy with a third stage uh, and flying a science instrument on board it. We've flown other um, uh, Delta IV Heavies, but not with science. And uh, this is really cool to be able to get uh, science that, um, that, that Gene here envisioned 60 years ago and, and finally getting it to fly. Um, I work for the Launch Services Program here at uh, NASA Kennedy Space Center. I am fortunate to be the Launch Director. I've been the Launch Director on numerous missions since uh, 2000. Um, and this rocket's just humbling for me. Uh, 430,000 miles per hour. That, the, the, the closest that came to that was uh, Pluto New Horizons when it left here. It was going 32,000 miles per hour, give or take. So uh, quite a difference. And the next fastest, I believe, is going 150, 175,000 miles an hour now, which is one of the Mariner probes. So uh, the speed is phenomenal. This vehicle is 233 feet tall. Um, if you get a chance to go out there and see it, it's just you, you have to see a human next to it to be able to capture how big this thing is. Um, like I said, I am from Launch Services Program. What we do is we contract with our partner ULA to build us a uh, launch vehicle and provide us a launch service. We partner with the 45th Space Range and many other partners here and downrange from here to make this mission happen. Um, so I am going to show you a, a film, if you could, of what it takes to build this rocket starting about a year ago when it arrived here, not built the rocket, but arrived here and assembled it. This is two of the uh, segments arriving. There's three of these um, of the common booster cores. They're going to complex 37 where they'll be bolted together. Here's the process. All three will be bolted together. The second stage is on front. That will be erected. That happened in uh, April of this year, along with Parker arriving on April 1st, Easter Day. It's just mind-boggling how big that really is. Here's Parker Solar Probe inside of the uh, fairing. Uh, and within there is the third stage. This is it being erected uh, about uh, 10 days ago. And being put on top of the second stage and bolted down. Um, so about a week, or beginning of this week, we had our flight readiness review. 
that's where we get a bunch of mucky mucks together and we talk about what's gone on with the launch vehicle technically, uh, how the range. Kathy Winters, our launch weather officer, provides us a synopsis of how the weather instrumentation is doing and what she can give us as far as a forecast at that point. The range tells us how um, their assets are coming together, and the spacecraft um, tells us um, how they're doing and how, what their readiness is. We turned that around into a mission dress rehearsal, which occurred yesterday. We get the whole team together and we practice the launch countdown, and uh, that was uh, successfully run. We, we're, we successfully stressed the team, and uh, we're quite ready for what we got ahead of us on Saturday. Um, this morning we had our launch readiness review. That went splendidly. Um, we're successfully complete. We're not working any issues. Uh, the next step for us is rolling the tower back, which will occur tomorrow about 6 in the uh, afternoon. About 10 o'clock at night, we'll get a weather brief, and that'll allow our folks to uh, decide whether we're going to load the vehicle with cryogenics. That'll start at about 1045. It's about a three and a half hour process. I'll do my uh, last poll roughly at eight minutes, and uh, at uh, two minutes, I'll give them uh, my final go for the uh, government. And uh, we should be launching at 3.33 in the morning. We have a 65-minute window. If we have to go to the following day, it becomes uh, a 3.29 in the morning launch. Again, 65-minute window. And that's kind of like it, it gets a little bit earlier every day. And that's all I have. Thank you so much. We're going to talk a little bit more about that Delta IV Heavy. Up next, we have Scott Messer, who can join us. He is the program manager for NASA programs for the United Launch Alliance. We're looking forward to this. Tell us about it. Thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of the uh, men and women of United Launch Alliance, I want to welcome you to the Parker Solar Probe uh, launch. This is a very, very exciting mission. Every time I hear Nikki and Andy talk, I get, uh, I get more and more excited about, uh, about this mission. So as mentioned, uh, we'll be launching on a Delta IV Heavy, uh, which is a five-meter vehicle in size. Uh, Omar mentioned it's about 233 uh, feet tall. Uh, when it takes off, the, uh, the thrust of just the first uh, stage, or the three cores, if you will, is about 2.1 million pounds. So we've heard a lot about speed today. Um, United Launch Alliance has launched six other uh, missions successfully this uh, year so far. And since our inception, uh, we've had 129 consecutive successful launches. So if you spent 60 years in the making for a mission and four million hours getting the spacecraft ready, you'd like to get uh, the, the most uh, reliable launch vehicle that you can to get there, and uh, that's what NASA has done by getting the Delta IV uh, Heavy. So the Heavy can uh, lift about 14,000 pounds uh, to geosynchronous orbit. And um, on the other hand, Parker Solar Probe weighs 1,400 pounds. So it's a little bit uh, lighter, and so you might ask, why such a large vehicle if you've only got such a small spacecraft is speed, all right? It, the th this thing goes like nothing ever has gone before, and it, uh, it is super fast. And in fact, you'd be interested to know, Omar mentioned, uh, we also have on top of our Delta IV Heavy a uh, third stage developed by uh, Northrop Grumman. And if you look at the velocity that the vehicle provides compared to the third stage, the third stage actually provides two-thirds of the, the speed that uh, the vehicle, uh, uh, the spacecraft is going at separation. And that's because you need all that big giant vehicle to get out of uh, the Earth's uh, gravitational pull and to get up there. And so once we get there, then the third stage only fires for about, an hour, about uh, a minute and a half. It's very short, but it imparts a lot of velocity to that third stage, and uh, our Northrop Grumman partners have done a great job in, in developing that. So uh, with that, let's take a look at the video. I'll kind of show you 
the sequence of events that will happen uh, uh, on launch day. Five, four, we have main engine ignition, two, one, and liftoff, liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket. Three Delta IV RS-68A main engines ignite and generate more than 2.1 million pounds of thrust to lift the rocket away from the pad. Shortly after liftoff, Delta IV begins a pitch over to attain the proper flight path while minimizing the pressure the vehicle experiences during flight. The Delta IV reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound, at 1 minute 18 seconds. At 3 minutes 56 seconds, the port and starboard booster engine shut down. Two seconds later, the boosters are jettisoned. The center booster engine then throttles to full power to maximize performance. Approaching main engine cutoff, Delta IV is burning propellant at a rate of 1,945 pounds per second, traveling at more than 15,381 miles per hour and located 86 miles in altitude and 415 miles downrange. At 5 minutes 36 seconds, propellant levels deplete and the main engine shuts down. Seven seconds later, the Delta IV separation system activates to release the first stage. The vehicle now weighs a little more than 5% of what it did at liftoff. At 5 minutes 55 seconds, the first Delta Cryogenic Second Stage, or DCSS main engine burn, begins. During ascent, the spacecraft is protected inside a 5-meter diameter payload fairing. At approximately 6 minutes 5 seconds, the payload fairing is jettisoned. At 10 minutes 37 seconds, cutoff of the DCSS engine, or MECO-1, occurs. The mission now enters a nearly 12-minute coast phase. At 22 minutes 25 seconds, the DCSS main engine is restarted for the second burn. Approximately 14 minutes later, second cutoff of the DCSS main engine occurs. Following a 30-second coast phase, the third stage is separated to continue carrying Parker's solar probe spacecraft on its interplanetary trajectory. 20 seconds later, after the third stage has reached a minimum distance of 50 feet from the DCSS, the third stage is ignited. Approximately 1 minute 29 seconds later, burnout of the third stage solid rocket motor occurs. At 43 minutes 10 seconds, the third stage releases NASA's Parker Solar Probe Space its journey to the sun. So those are the events that uh, will occur on uh, Saturday morning. You got, a, you got a little bit of a view as you looked at uh, the, the Parker Solar Probe spacecraft and the, uh, the big five meter size uh, vehicle that you saw there. Uh, so NASA chose the, the Delta IV Heavy because of its unique capabilities to, to create the speed. Um, the last time, I think Omar or somebody mentioned, the last time NASA flew uh, on the Delta IV Heavy was the EFT-1 mission back in 2014. This will be the ninth launch of the, uh, or the tenth launch of the Delta IV Heavy. The Delta IV Heavy first launched in 2004, uh, 2004 so almost 14 years ago and only 10 launches. So you can see we don't, uh, this, the heavy is not something we launch all that often. So it's a, it's a very exciting for us as well as the spacecraft. And uh, as mentioned earlier, United Launch Alliance, we pride ourselves on making sure that our customers have, get all of their uh, requirements met and are fully successful in getting it there. So we, uh, we want to say thank you once again to uh, all of our mission partners and to NASA for allowing us to participate in this very exciting mission. And uh, I'll just close with a go Delta, go Parker Solar Probe. Thank you so much. So we've been hearing all about all the things we have done to prepare for this launch, but we have one last thing that needs to go right, and that is the weather. To tell us a little bit about that, we have Kathy Rice. She is the launch weather officer with the 45th Weather Squadron with the Air Force right here at Cape Canaveral. Thank you. Thanks. I am super excited about this mission, and I'm really excited about the 3.33 a.m. launch time. 
<laughs> because in the summertime here in Florida, 3.33 p.m. is very bad and 3.33 a.m. is very good. We do expect to see these afternoon thunderstorms each day, but as the day goes on and we get into the evening, they'll dissipate. And then we'll just have to watch out for anything that forms offshore. Sometimes at night that, that air cools, the water's a little warmer than the air, you get a little warming of the air just above the water, you get some rising air and you start getting some cumulus clouds offshore. Um, but that happens more over the Gulf Stream, so it's looking more on the favorable side for launch. Um, we will be dealing with a little bit of thunderstorm activity around the time of the mobile service tower roll tomorrow evening, but it should be finishing around that time, so it's looking good as we get into that, that operation and then uh, moving forward into the countdown. So again, we'll just be watching for some clouds that we get concerned about for triggered lightning threat. We can trigger a lightning strike with a launch. And so it's not just a thunderstorm we're concerned about. We're also concerned about towering cumulus clouds or the tops of thunderstorms we call anvil clouds that come off and spread. So there's more than just the risk of, of natural lightning. We also are concerned about triggered lightning. So let's go ahead and look at the satellite picture um, for today. You can see that we do have that west coast sea breeze making its way across. We're in a southwest flow pattern. What that means for us is our sea breeze forms and kind of gets pinned along the coast. The west coast sea breeze moves across and merges. And so we get a lot of thunder storm activity in the afternoons, particularly in the late afternoon um, in this type of pattern. We're expecting this to continue for the next several days. But the early morning hours are good in this type of pattern, so that's good for us. So let's go ahead and move into the launch forecast. You can see that we do have um, light winds. We're really not worried about winds um, because of the gradients, the pressure radiance really light over the area. Temperature is always around the upper 70s to low 80s in the overnight hours here. And our only concerns will be offshore weather mostly, but anything coming within 10 nautical miles of us will be watching. So any cumulus clouds, any de detached or attached anvil clouds, those clouds that come off of the top of the thunderstorms heading our direction. The winds in the upper levels will be from the east, and so we'll be watching that, uh, just paying attention to that. With that, we have a 30% chance of violating launch weather constraints. So 70% chance go. Okay, and for our 24-hour forecast, um, we are looking a little bit worse. The relative humidity in the atmosphere gets a little higher. It gives us better chance for clouds in the area. So with that, I did increase the number to a 40% chance of violating launch constraints. And finally, if we happen to go one more day, it does get a lot drier, so I dropped the chance of just a 20% chance. But you can see each day the winds are light. It's really all about the clouds in the area and that triggered lightning threat. So overall, good launch time, so hopefully we have some good weather. Thank you. We can have the, the team come up for the Q&A here. And again, if you're joining us, we're coming to you live from the NASA Kennedy Space Center in Florida, a few days before the early morning launch of the Parker Solar Probe. And now we're going to go on the Q&A sec section here. And what better way, Karen, to celebrate the 60th anniversary to, but to be here for the Solar Parker Probe, right? I mean, this is fantastic. So we're going to start again here with uh, media. And please wait for the mic and give your name and affiliation. And we'll go to social media and the phone bridge, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. So right here. Stephen Young with Astronomy Now and Spaceflight Now for OMAR. Um, we've seen lots of different launch times. They keep changing. Um, normally with a planetary mission, we think that these things are written in stone. Is there a reason why the launch times are so fluid with this mission? It's and then have a follow-up. So it's on? OK. So, so there had been some, uh, with the shifts, in the days, the delays since the opening of the window, there had been some shifts. Uh, through the, um, we started this with a two hour window. And um, as we looked at the trajectory, we um, realized that um, we are coming close to the Van Allen belts as we fly out. So we have a radiation concern on the launch vehicle as we fly near the Van Allen belts. Uh, which we have to s stay away from because it, it could mess with our electronics and we don't want that to happen on the way up. And so you'll see the, the window cut off at 65 minutes. Um, we had been playing with um, uh, different analysis to see what was the better option. So I wasn't firm on how large our window was. I would say about from anywhere from 45 minutes to 65. We're now at 65. There's opportunities later in the window where it expands to about 70 minutes. Uh, but after that point, the risk of seeing uh, an upset on the way up uh, increases uh, dramatically. Uh, the very beginning of the window had some constraints early on. 
um, with the spacecraft being uh, able to be picked up by a station in South Africa, Hartebeestuk, um, and so there was, a, there was a risk trade that had to be made as to whether that station was needed along with another station uh, that's further downrange that could see the, the uh, spacecraft on its initial um, separation. So that's why there was a shift. Okay? The uh, final last minute problems you had getting out of AstroTech and on the way to the launch pad, could you just address those issues and how you resolve them? Sure. And also how you got a couple of extra days um, at the end of the, the launch opportunity? Okay, so, so let me address the, uh, we had two delays on the way out. First we had, um, we were dealing with a, a very uh, sensitive instrument purge that, that keeps the um, instruments on the spacecraft uh, purged with nitrogen um, to keep any of the environment away from it, moisture, um, dust, whatever it may be that we have here that, that these instruments uh, don't like to see and you want to maintain them in pristine condition when you go out to do the science. So we did have some problems uh, with uh, some leaks in that purge as it uh, threads its way up through the adapter cone through the third stage. And so that cost us a, a couple of days. After we were done with that, um, we did have an issue where we um, uh, damaged the electrical connector that had to be we had to separate the stage again, or the fairing, to get at this connector, repair it, and get it back together. And finally, um, we had some issue with a uh, minor weather stripping foam, is the best analogy I can give you that you would use around the home that has adhesive on one size. Well, that foam uh, started to um, liberate itself from from the sides of the fairing. So we had to separate the fairing again, clean off all that foam, account for all those pieces, and make those uh, stages back together. Um, so that cost us, as you, you know, we started this on the 30th, we took a delay to the 4th, then we took a delay to the 6th, and we took a delay finally to the 11th. That's where we're at now. How we were able to get the additional four days that had been in the works for quite some time. Uh, from the launch vehicle perspective, um, we could, we, we actually had that in work over a year ago to add those additional days. The spacecraft hadn't had a chance to add those days, so that came in very late for us. That's why we expanded it from the 19th to the 23rd, fairly late um, uh, for, the, for the public's knowledge until the spacecraft was able to go analyze and plan for those days. And that's how we had those additional four days. But that is the cliff. Okay, before we go to social, um, you have the mic, so really a quick question. It is quick. Uh, Sylvia Rosenstein with Talking Space. Question about that uh, upper third stage. So I know that's not very common with these science missions. So what exactly is the planned parking orbit for the Delta IV's first and second stage, uh, and then how much extra speed is that third stage going to give in miles per hour or something like that? You want to give it a shot, Scott? So uh, what I can tell you as far as the speed is that we, our requirement is a measurement of the velocity called C3. And uh, the, the, the first and second stage of the Delta IV get us to a C3 of about 50-52 and the third stage then takes us from 50 to 152. So like I said, about two-thirds of the, of the actual velocity after we get out of the, the Earth's atmosphere. Um, uh, the other stages uh, will be, so the second stage and the third stage, they're on a uh, course to leave the, the atmosphere, so they just, they just go, and we don't, there's no parking stage with those. The, and the first, uh, the cores will, will fall back down into the, into the ocean. Great, so now we'll take a question over here from the social media side. Uh, Jack, is this on? 
Is this on now? Okay. Uh, Jack Sauter with YouTube. Is there any contingency plan in case the third stage doesn't ignite, or is the likelihood so low that you'll just get there if you get there? So we, there is no contingency plan because, it, like most of the stuff in the rocket, it has to work the first time. We're, we're not something that can upload a command like sometimes you hear the spacecraft do after if they have a problem. Everything has to work the first time. So we go through a very rigorous uh, test program uh, to make sure that we have the maximum probability that everything is, is going to work as, a, as appropriate. Uh, the engine that we use on the third stage is an engine that's flown uh, many times. The Star 48 motor has flown hundreds and hundreds of times, and uh, ignition has always been successful. So we just have to go through the process of testing and designing and testing and designing and testing and to make sure that we have the maximum probability that everything is going to work. All right, we are, we still have time for a few more questions, but we're getting close to the end of the show. I want to make sure we get in a question from the users who wrote in with Ask NASA as their hashtag. A Twitter user named Brady asks, how long did it take to develop the technology uh, to survive the simultaneous fusions occurring in the sun? I think that's the I guess a spacecraft. Uh, Andy, do you want to repeat the question? Yes. Uh, a user by the name of Brady on Twitter asked, how long did it take to develop the technology that will survive the t simultaneous fusions occurring in the sun? Well, fusion is um, what powers the sun, so that's deep down in the, in the heart of the sun. We're going close, but we're not going that close. <laughs> so at um, uh, four million miles off the surface, um, the temperatures are um, about two to three million degrees um, Fahrenheit. Um, the spacecraft flies through that, that plasma. The plasma is very uh, rarefied, it's not very dense, so the spacecraft doesn't pick up a lot of heat from that, um, that environment. Okay, thank you. One last question from our social here, and then we're, we'll wrap up. All right, we, anybody we else over here? In one. Oh, thank you. This might also be for the science team, but what I know Parker Solar Probe has a lot of scientific instruments, but then there's like Juno, which has Juno Cam for public, public outreach. Will Parker Solar Probe have anything like that? Uh, so, no, so no, we only carry exactly what we need for uh, the science. Um, as we noted, we have to be incredibly light, uh, even, you know, uh, cut, you know, we don't carry anything extra. And so our instruments are there to do the job that they are meant to do. We do have a white light imager, and we will be providing you with the first ever look at the sun's corona. So there is no um, sort of add-on camera on there. Uh, we are doing all science with our instruments 24-7. Let's give a nice round of applause for our launch team here. Thank you all. So you can stay part of the conversation uh, going to our Twitter handle at NASA Sun and using the hashtag Solar Probe. And of course, we expect everybody to be watching this live on uh, nasa.gov slash live at uh, 3 a.m. That's cut uh, coverage starts. Yeah. Launch coverage starts at 3 a.m. Eastern. Please uh, look out for updates. And um, as before we close the show, just a reminder, we have a a fantastic contingent of scientists, principal investigators, engineers, and technical folks to answer your questions for the folks on the phone bridge and watching on live on TV. They'll be at the press site and then call the press site. There are plenty of incredible folks that can give you interviews, and there's a lot of excitement and buzz. So we're going to conclude here today. Um, uh, lots of excitement. www.nasa.gov slash Parker, right? And Got it. I think... We're ready to the sign off is we just one got one last countdown for you. Okay. Right? Ready? So we guys ready? Three, two, two one. one. Go, Go Parker, Parker Solar Pro. Thank you all. See you at launch on Saturday.